Eastern uh, Eastern Range reports uh, everything's go at this point, and uh, the visibility problems that we observed uh, yesterday are not present today. So that is good for our 10 optical sites. And we see Andy Thomas there being prepared uh, for boarding as well. The uh, light sticks being installed on the arm of uh, Andy Thomas. Six people make up the White Room closeout crew that are assisting the astronauts, including a pad leader, the uh, support astronaut who we mentioned, a suit technician, a quality control engineer, and two orbiter mechanical technicians. And they'll be there until the crew access hatch is scheduled to be closed uh, almost exactly an hour from now.
has another slightly smaller cross ball uh, inside of the field of view here on this on this picture, but it was located uh, approximately down here where the, the next circle is, or a little bit further down there. Uh, apparently, right on the knit line of that closeout on the barrel section of the seed line. But uh, during the time we were out there, that was dissipating quite a bit. OTC CJLS on two one two. Yeah, let's go. Give you step uh, 521, completed implementation of SAP 92, and that's steps 514 through 521 all performed. Copy that, thank you. OTC, CDR, come check. CDR, this is OTC, you're loud and clear. Good morning, Eileen. Good morning, Mark, you're loud and clear also. CDR, this is NTD. I have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard, Eileen. Thank you, Jeff. And you're loud and clear also. Suichi so Noguchi from Jackson now steps into the picture. Houston, CDR, come check. CDR, Houston, we have you loud and clear. Good morning, Eileen. And good morning, Ken. We have you loud and clear also. Okay, moving over to the, uh, the uh, lock speed line. Uh, the bellows, uh, the forward bellows look in great shape. Uh, we took a, a good look at the uh, gap, uh, heater gap location. There was no ice frost formation at all at the heater gap location. Uh, so that was working uh, quite well there. Uh, the uh, aft and uh, mid and aft bellows did have ice frost formations on them. Uh, they were uh, well within the 8303 criteria and did not extend out to the uh, driftlet. Uh, the uh, feed line brackets uh, from the top. Uh, Ice inspection team lead Armando Oliu continuing to deliver his report to launch director Mike Leinbach. on board at this time. 're being joined now here in firing room three by astronaut Alan Poindexter he's currently serving in the astronaut office shuttle operations branch and performing duties uh, as the lead support astronaut at Kennedy Space Center and he's assigned to STS 120 Alan uh, welcome good morning George glad to be here 
Well, the crew is uh, making uh, progress in their in their boarding. And uh, how would you sort of uh, sum up what the uh, astronauts are doing right now as they've uh, gotten in and are getting prepared uh, to launch? And uh, what will they be doing that's coming up? Well, George, what we're looking at here is a view of the mid deck. In the foreground is Charlie Camarda. And uh, there you see number seven on the closeout crew. Mr. Ray Cuevas is uh, strapping in Andy Thomas to his seat as uh, MS-3. They're uh, going through all of their uh, personal equipment checks and they're getting strapped in and getting their parachute hooked up. And then uh, they'll start a series of communication checks and I believe you've heard some of the crew members already check in with those. And uh, let's see, we've got uh, Suichi here. He's, he's about ready to board. He has Suichi's in the white room. He's getting his comm cap assembly on. He'll go through a series of checks here with a closeout crew personnel in the white room. And then uh, when the suit technicians and the insert in insertion technicians are ready for him, he'll uh, go through the hatch and begin strapping into his seat. So they, uh, those that are on board, the uh, crew suit technicians actually say when they're ready for the next crew member to board as opposed to when Suichi's ready, he just gets on. Oh, that's right, George. Uh, we don't want uh, too many people moving around on the inside the crew module at once, so we'll wait until the uh, seat's ready and the uh, insertion technician's ready for him, and then we'll ask Suichi to run through the hatch and uh, board his seat on the flight deck as MS-1. And there you can see he's holding up a sign. It looks like a get-out-of-quarantine-free card, George. The crew's been in quarantine for quite some time now, and I think they're a little anxious to, uh, to go fly in here. Now, we see the suit technician holding on to an umbilical here. Is, he, is Suichi going to be connected to that? Uh, George, that's a... Uh, cooling hose that's attached to the suit while he's on the pad surface and in the white room prior to entering the crew module. Once we, once he's in his seat, we'll hook up a liquid cooling unit that will pump cold water through his suit to uh, cool him off. That device is, uh, just blows cool air on him. George, the personnel that you see in the white suits are what we call a closeout crew, as you know. And uh, those personnel are all volunteers. And uh, it's a great honor for them to, to be up on the pad, uh, assisting the crew in uh, getting aboard the vehicle. And then uh, their critical job is to make sure that the hatch closes properly once the crew is loaded. Uh, we'll see here in a bit that they close the hatch and do a series of leak checks make sure that the uh, vehicle is nice and tight, then they'll start securing the white room environment and be ready to exit the pad and leave the crew by themselves in the ship. How do they you know, close the hatch when they're ready or do they await a command from the NASA test director or how does that work? That's right, George. The NASA test director will give them a command to uh, close the hatch. Once we make sure that all non-flight items are removed from the crew module, the NASA test director will give them a, a go to close the hatch and they'll to start that process. It's about a half hour to 45 minute process to make sure that it gets all sealed up tightly. How many astronauts are actually on board um, helping the uh, 114 crew? That's a great question. We have one astronaut on the closeout crew. Lieutenant Colonel Lee Archambault uh, is the what we call the astronaut support person. He's a member of the closeout crew. We'll see a view of him here momentarily. He's uh, number two. And he is assisting all of the crew members in their strap-in, in their communications checks. And then he assists the commander and the pilot in some switch actuations that are very difficult for them to reach once they're strapped into their seat. And uh, how long does he stay aboard? He will stay aboard. He will be the last person out of the crew module uh, before hatch closure. And 
he uh, got in the vehicle about three hours ago and started doing his final checks uh, of the crew module and making sure that all the switches are in the right place. And all the equipment is ready to go, and he's triple-checked all that now, and he'll be the last person uh, out of the crew module before hatch closure. And it looks like uh, we have Wendy Lawrence uh, on deck as well. Indeed, Wendy's uh, suiting up, and we're, we'll get her on the mid-deck in just a few minutes here. Soichi is ready to go on to the flight deck, and there's Mr. George Birdingham, number three. That's Soichi's insertion technician, and he'll go aboard, and then Soichi will follow him shortly. How many people are in the white room at any one time? Is there a comfortable number or a standard number? The uh, white room can uh, hold quite a few people. Uh, we limit that on launch morning. Once we put any kind of propellants in the tanks, we want to limit the number of people on the pad due to the hazardous operations. So we have uh, seven closeout crew members and seven flight crew members. So right now you've got about 14 people out there. CSS OTC. CSS. Give you a 579 on your force charge. Copy. OTC, CBSC 212. CBSC, OTC, go. Uh, roger, uh, step 588 is not performed. Copy that. OTC, PLT, com check. ELT, OTC, I have you loud and clear. Good morning, Vegas. Well, Mark, take it loud and clear as well, thanks. No, OTC, CGSS. CGSS, go. 580 and 581 complete. Copy. NTD, PLT, com check. TLT, this is NTD. I have you loud and clear. Good morning, Vegas. Got you loud and clear as well, Jeff. Thanks. Houston, PLT, com check. PLT, Houston, you are loud and clear. Good morning, Vegas. Good morning, I got you loud and clear as well. Ready to go. It looks like Eileen has, has got some notes there on the left. What would those be? Uh, George, uh, those are, that's her window flip book notes. Those are uh, actually emergency procedures that she'll need to follow um, in the event of a malfunction. Uh, those are her immediate action steps that, that she'll take if, uh, if indeed we had a malfunction. We don't expect one, obviously, but um, we just need to be prepared for that, that contingency. Number two there, Lee, is uh, doing a final check of, of Eileen's gear. Uh, the, the view we're looking at right now is from a, a camera that's on Jim Kelly's window. That camera is not there for launch. It's just used for our strap-in period here. In a few moments, Lee should be moving that camera to a view uh, of the aft flight deck seats. We heard... Uh, Pilot Jim Kelly give his communications checks just a few moments ago, and everything checked out normally there. Meanwhile, the countdown is continuing to go along smoothly. The uh, Eastern Range Command Carrier checks are just beginning, and uh, so far everything is uh, proceeding on the timeline. Very little discussion on the uh, on the uh, engineering channels. That's a real good view of the of the flight deck seats. OTC, CDR, and TLT ingress is complete, and I request to go for the post ingress switch reconfig for the S checklist. Ask OTC, you have a go. And there you hear the call Thanks. from the uh, astronaut support person, Lee Archambault, to the uh, orbiter test conductor to uh, ask for permission to reconfigure the switches that uh, wait until the pilot and commander are in their seats. 
We don't want to reconfigure. We don't want to configure those switches too early, uh, for fear that we may bump them once the uh, while loading the crew. So we wait until the last minute, and then the astronaut support person gets those for them. Now you can see the uh, detail in which everyone is paying to uh, all of the equipment on the crew members. And the number of people that inspect that equipment, and we want to make sure that uh, absolutely nothing is wrong with it. And, uh, and once we close the hatch, that uh, everything is just fine. So that equipment is double checked and triple checked. And then uh, one final check once the crew member is strapped in. The crew will be laying on their backs for up to three hours, George, and uh, it can get a bit uncomfortable. So we wanted to also make sure that uh, that all the equipment fits properly, and that's what you can see uh, Ray Cuevas doing now with Wendy's gear, making sure that her harness is on smoothly, that there aren't any uh, bunches of material caught up underneath her straps. And laying on her back for that long uh, may get painful, so we want to make them as comfortable as possible. Can they take the suits off as soon as they're in orbit, or do they wait for a command from Houston Flight, or how does that work? Just about as soon as the uh, engines are in, are cut off, uh, the mid-deck crew members are coming out of their seats. Now, the immediate thing on this flight and uh, subsequent flights will be to get pictures of the external tank after separation. Andy Thomas will be the uh, prime crew member for that, and he'll need to get some cameras that we've stowed for him out of their uh, stowage locker right away and get up to the flight deck and start taking pictures out of the overhead windows of the external tank. We frequently hear about the flight data files that have been stowed aboard. Exactly what is a flight data file? Flight data file is a, um, a big word for our checklists. We use those uh, checklists for all of our procedures, both nominal and off nominal. And there are uh, volumes of books aboard that, uh, that we'll use for different tasks. We have a set for ascent, we have a set for orbit, we have a set for entry, and then we have subsets of those for special tasks like rendezvous and robotics operations, as well as the EVAs, which have their own set of books as well. So if we hear before launch that the crew is spending time reviewing their flight data files, a lot of that might be part of their mission on orbit. Some of that is uh, studying for their operations on orbit, and some of that is personal notes that they'll, they've taken for uh, things they want to accomplish in what order they want to get those things done in. One of the largest things we have to do after uh, main engine cutoff is turn the orbiter into an orbiting vehicle. And we need to get the payload bay doors open, we need to get the crew module reconfigured, we need to get uh, ascent equipment stowed and orbit equipment unstowed. We need to get seats folded, suits off. And as you can imagine, it's uh, cramped quarters, and with all the extra gear that you're carrying in, we need to make sure that it's uh, in an efficient manner. And OTC, OVCC. VCC, OTC. MS-4 on board at this time. 1152. And there we see uh, Wendy Lawrence entering the uh, through the hatch and uh, onto the mid-deck to take her seat between Charlie and Andy. You can see the straps hanging down, George. Those straps are used as assist handles to get in and out of the seat. You know, the vehicle's in the vertical here. The crew enters and then has to uh, lay on their backs for launch. And uh, what looks like a, a knee board here? That is a knee board on uh, Charlie's uh, right knee, and uh, he's got a notepad to take notes. He's also got a stopwatch to keep track of uh, items uh, during the ascent and uh, post main engine cutoff. Ray uh, Cuevas there. Uh, is uh, going to start hooking Wendy up to her seat and uh, making sure that her parachute is uh, attached properly to her harness. 
That's Steve Robinson has entered the white room now. He'll be the last crew member to board today in, uh, in the MS-2 seat behind the commander and pilot. I don't know if you saw the pictures earlier of uh, Steve uh, playing his guitar in crew quarters, but he's, Steve is uh, quite the musician. He's in the astronaut band Max Q. He's quite the accomplished guitarist. Well, they seem to be very upbeat, having had to wait this uh, troubleshooting out, but uh, just observing their mindset appears to be very positive today. Very positive, yet very focused, George. The crew, I spoke to each one of them this morning, uh, are extremely focused on the work that they have to get done. The uh, flight plan is uh, very full. They have uh, very little time for uh, free time, so they're uh, focused on getting their job done. Now we see Suichi entering his seat. Uh, this is a really good view from the glare shield between the commander and pilot looking aft into the vehicle. And we see Suichi in the uh, MS-1 seat and uh, the two closeout crew members there. We've got uh, George and uh, Lee assisting them. The uh, two uh, windows in the uh, vehicle overhead there, as you can see the, the light shining through are the same windows that we'll use for uh, rendezvous and proximity operations with the space station and also to uh, do Earth observations and uh, especially early on in this mission will be those are the windows that Andy will be using to take pictures of the external tank. Now will those pictures be coming back to us live or will they be taped and replayed? Those are uh, digital pictures taken with a uh, digital uh, camcorder and also a digital uh, 35 uh, millimeter SLR camera. They uh, will be reviewed and then downlinked uh, back to Houston for for uh, critical observation. When the crew went back to Houston, what were the, some of the things they did while they were there? They went back to Houston. Uh, the uh, commander decided that uh, they would like to have a little more practice in the uh, shuttle mission simulator since it had been a, a week or longer since they'd had uh, their previous one. So they went back to Houston, uh, did a quick uh, four-hour run in the shuttle mission simulator, and then uh, flew back down to the Kennedy Space Center on Friday. George, this is also a real good view of the uh, flight deck, and you can see with the uh, fisheye lens that we're using just how many uh, switches and circuit breakers uh, are aboard the space shuttle. The crew needs to know what each one of those does, and uh, the good news is that in nominal operations uh, for Ascent, we don't touch any of those. If everything goes well, it'll be uh, completely automatic and uh, everything should function normally. Prior to launch, though, we will do some reconfiguration, and that's what you heard Lee doing earlier. Now, in the back, the kind of switches and the panel that we see there are primarily for what? Well, the uh, back panel is the uh, orbit station, and then you can see uh, George Birdingham working around that station right now. Those uh, just to the uh, just to the right at the bottom right of your screen you see one panel that's the uh, robotics panel that uh, operates the shuttle robotic arm and uh, just below George is a station that the commander will position herself at uh, for rendezvous there is a, a a station there where we can fly the vehicle from the aft station Eileen will will uh, stay in her seat during rendezvous until about an hour and a half, two hours prior to actually docking with the station. At that point, she'd move back into the aft station and start flying the vehicle from there. That's interesting. She's not actually in the commander's seat at the at time of rendezvous. At rendezvous, she'll be in that uh, that aft position and looking up through the overhead windows and, and the uh, aft windows to, to, to uh, watch the rendezvous as it happens. Here we see Steve Robinson in the white room. It looks like he's got his harness on, and he'll be ready to go in in just a few moments. And uh, what will pilot 
Jim Kelly's role be in the rendezvous process? Jim will be assisting uh, Eileen during the initial portions of the rendezvous uh, up through what we call the manual phase. And once that, uh, once we get to that manual phase, he'll move over from the pilot seat to the commander's seat, and he'll be backing up Eileen from the from the front left seat. We also have uh, Charlie Camarda and Wendy Lawrence on the flight deck, uh, helping with the rendezvous process. There you see uh, another closeout crew member. That's uh, Tim Seymour there, helping Steve with his harness and making sure that it's nice and tight. And uh, Renee Arians there behind Steve is going to also help make sure that the harness is, is uh, attached properly. Houston MS5, comp check, how do you read? MS5 Houston, we have you loud and clear. Good morning, Charlie. And I have you loud and clear also, uh, good morning. And there you hear a good communications checks with uh, Charlie Camarda and the uh, Capcom back in Houston, uh, Ken Ham. Let's see, we just heard the launch polynomial update is complete in the countdown process. What would that mean? Yeah, we were, uh, there are a number of, uh, of parameters that are uplinked to the vehicle uh, just prior to launch. We call them the day of launch uh, iLoad updates. And we want to make sure that uh, the conditions, the atmospheric conditions, and the weather conditions of the day are on the vehicle uh, for the uh, vehicle guidance computers to... Uh, to uh, guide the vehicle through the atmosphere uh, as efficiently as possible. We're also uh, making sure that the uh, orbit of the space station is exactly as predicted. We need to launch the space shuttle into the same pl orbital plane as the space station. And so we want to make sure that the station is to directly overhead as we launch. There's a picture of uh, Wendy getting her gloves on, George, and uh, those gloves are the uh, final piece of the pressure suit that she'll be wearing that all the crew members wear. And uh, you can see that they've got a, a metal ring at the at the base of the glove there. That's a, a pressure seal. And then the uh, helmet is, and visor are closed uh, just prior to launch. At that point, uh, the uh, launch and entry suit is sealed. And uh, should we have a uh, depressurization in the crew module, the uh, pressure suit would inflate at that point and uh, allow the crew member uh, to have breathing air.
LPS, this is engine E step 671. Momentary loss of downloads will occur. Verify you're ready for downloads. Okay. The uh, countdown activities are still uh, very routine at this point. Uh, there's really no issues in work. It's right by the timeline and right by the book. It's been very smooth. The uh, external tank sensors are continuing to perform as, uh, as intended. Do we need to work that? Uh, that will have to be worked, yes. Okay, let me know when you can verify that completely. OTC, MS3, contact. MS3, this is OTC. I have you loud and clear. Good morning, Andy. Good morning. Got you loud and clear also. Thank you. Houston, we have you loud and clear. Good morning, Andy. Glad to got you loud and clear also. Thank you. George, sounds like uh, Andy Thomas's comm gear is working just fine. He's just finished his communication checks with uh, the orbiter test conductor, the NASA test director, and also the Capcom back in Houston. Some of those checks are done with their uh, visor in the up position, and then the last check is done with the visor in the down position, and the uh, suit oxygen turned on. We want to make sure that the oxygen equip the uh, communication equipment works under a pressure environment. You can see how just how restrictive the suit and helmet are. It is a lot of gear to wear and it's uh, cumbersome and your work envelope is very small when you have the gloves and the helmet on. So they're uh, looking forward to the church leave environment after they get into space. Absolutely. That'll be one of the first things they do is get out of the launch and entry suits. They're hot, and uh, they do have liquid cooling on underneath, but they're still uh, hot and bulky, but, uh, but necessary for protection. Looks like uh, Colonel Archambault is giving Wendy her uh, final checks of her of all of our safety gear. And then uh, Travis Thompson uh, in the center of your screen with the USA hat is uh, the closeout crew leader. You'll hear him on the radio referred to as the OVCC. He's a very experienced uh, gentleman and has been at this for a long time. And uh, he is in charge of the uh, closeout crew and making sure everything goes smoothly on the pad. And he reports directly to the orbiter test conductor and the NASA test director. OTC MS4 contract. MS4, this is OTC. I have you loud and clear. Good morning, Wendy. Yeah, we'll see. Good morning, Mark. See Steve Robinson entering the crew module, and Wendy. We hear Wendy Lawrence doing her communications checks. And OTC, OVCC, VCC, OTC. MS2 on board at this time, and that is all crew members on board at this time. 1208, thank you. And that's good news. We've got them all aboard. NTD, MS4 contract. MS4, this is NTD, and I have you loud and clear. Good morning, Wendy. Good morning, Jeff. Now, Steve Robinson, he's in that particular seat for a reason, as flight engineer. That's right. MS4, Houston. 
So he his role as flight engineer includes what? Good morning, Hunter. Steve's job uh, is to assist the uh, commander and pilot in uh, their tasks for uh, ascent and entry. He is uh, the flight engineer, and uh, he is really the uh, the umpire on the flight deck. He is keeping track of everything, and he's listening to the communications. And there are certain uh, certain parameters that the commander and pilot uh, have a difficult time seeing and so he'll assist them and make it sure that uh, they get to the right switch he'll back them up on their uh, switch positions he'll help them uh, keep an eye on uh, all the uh, orbiters computers and all of the parameters that need to be watched and in the event of a malfunction in the rare event of a malfunction he would uh, he would assist them to make sure that they are on their correct procedure and in the correct step prior to performing those Suichi uh, in the MS-1 seat is equally as critical for the uh, ascent and entry tasks. He's got his uh, own set of uh, jobs that he needs to perform. GSS OTC. GSS. You to go to one, two, three. Here we see uh, Ray um, opening up some uh, chemical light sticks and inserting those in different places on the mid deck. And those are uh, used for emergency lighting if we were to lose all electrical power, and that would be a very rare event given the uh, redundancy that we have on board. But if we were to lose uh, all electrical power, we'd want to make sure that uh, the uh, crew module is illuminated, and we've got those chemical light sticks aboard for that. In addition, each crew member has some orange-colored chemical light sticks in their flight suit, and I believe you can see the one on Andy's right shoulder there in that uh, view, and one on Charlie Camarda's as well. We want to be absolutely sure that we could find a crew member uh, in the event of a bailout, and uh, hence the orange-colored suit and the orange-colored light sticks. OTCS. OTC, go. And, uh, I'm sorry, sir, recall me? Negative. Okay, apologize. Okay. Hey, step 608, so it's all purge complete. See that, Mike, thank you. And at this point of the countdown, the uh, NASA test director has given a uh, direction that the vehicle assembly building doors be closed. That's done as a uh, precaution normally at this uh, point in the countdown. Oh, that's great. It means we're getting close, George. And the weather looks absolutely gorgeous outside. Yes, Okay, sir, uh, just a status update here. We got the uh, mid -deck, three mid-deck uh, flyers in good shape, and uh, we're just finishing up uh, number uh, seat number uh, four. Uh, once we get the MS-1 and MS-2 checks complete, we'll start closing out. I'll be on. Thank you, sir. And there you hear communication between the orbiter test conductor and the astronaut support personnel, Lee Archambault, and the crew module, coordinating to make sure that we get all non-flight items out of the crew module and that all crew members have... Uh, been uh, been checked and their communications equipment is in order and they're strapped in properly. Once all of that's done, uh, you'll hear the order given to uh, close the crew module for flight, and then we'll start the process of hatch closure. I think you can see in this uh, in this view just how uh, focused the crew members are. Everyone's studying their procedures and uh, making sure they know exactly what's going to happen here.
And the good thing is, with all the uh, anticipation, that this has really been a very quiet countdown. Well, let's uh, knock on wood, and uh, I think um, it, it, it's testament to all of the hard work of the thousands of personnel that uh, that, that uh, make a, a space shuttle launch happen, both here at the Kennedy Space Center, at the Johnson Space Center back in Houston, Marshall Space Flight Center, and all across the NASA community across the country. We've uh, just went through a, a very thorough process in the last uh, 10 days to make sure that uh, everything with these uh, engine cutoff sensors was was uh, rung out. And uh, lots of folks working many, many long hours to make sure that happens. So when launch counts go smoothly like this, it's a testament to just how well they do their job. So many things have to go just right and in, in the correct order to uh, to launch a space shuttle. A lot of redundancy involved, and uh, we want to make sure that everything is working uh, just as designed. And it looks like uh, Steve has got his uh, helmet on now. You can see George making sure that the seal is uh, really tight. And you can see that he's got uh, two microphones there. Those microphones are redundant. If we were to lose one of them, he would still be able to use the other. George, it looks like we may have uh, a minor problem here with uh, Steve's helmet. Occasionally, a, a piece of material will get in the seal, and we'll need to remove the helmet and uh, move the material. It's usually a part of the uh, the neck dam, the rubber gasket around the, the crew member's neck. And you can see there that George is pressing that down to make sure that it won't interfere at all with the seal. The tolerances on those uh, helmet seals is extremely tight, and uh, any small piece of material in the way would prevent it from closing properly. So it looks like George has removed the helmet now and is double checking that that neck dam is uh, completely out of the way and that the comm cap assembly is also equally tucked in, and uh, he'll reattempt to uh, install the helmet again. And these get checked during suit up as well, do they not? They do. They get checked uh, back in the suit room at the uh, operations and checkout building where the crew quarters is, and uh, they will they will check them there, and they will do a complete pressure check of the suit and the integrity of the suit and helmet and gloves. But once that helmet comes back off and the crew member moves around a little bit, sometimes the uh, the material will will uh, get moved up. And it looks like we've got a good helmet seal this time. There you see uh, George Birdingham uh, attaching some of the communications gear to, uh, to Steve Robinson. And he'll put his gloves on as well. And, uh, here's a uh, interesting note. Uh, George is actually standing. His right foot is placed on a platform that covers up the aft window in the uh, orbit station there. Those, uh, those platforms will be removed just prior to hatch closure, but they allow the support personnel 
uh, access to assist the crew members into their seat. Otherwise, they'd have to be standing on top of a switch panel. Those, uh, those temporary access panels will be removed, like I said, and then, uh, and then we'll have, then the crew will be able to uh, view the payload bay through those windows. And uh, actually, without that, I, I don't the. Um floor between the mid-deck and the flight deck, that's not really designed to take the full weight of a crew member, is it? That's right. Uh, there are areas of the flight deck and mid-deck that will not hold the weight of a uh, crew member in 1G, and uh, we use these uh, access platforms just for that purpose, to, to have access to areas that we wouldn't normally have access to. Those are all removed uh, prior to launch, and uh, once the vehicle's on orbit, of course, we wouldn't need those. Here's a uh, view of the mid-deck with uh, all three crew members aboard. We've got uh, Andy Thomas at the uh, top of your screen, uh, then Wendy, Tom Wendy Lawrence in the middle, and uh, Dr. Charlie Camarda at the bottom of your screen. This is uh, Charlie Camarda's first space flight. He became an astronaut in uh, 1996. Well, he's been waiting quite some time for this opportunity. And I can tell you, I talked to him this morning, he's really excited about it. Now, what, you've got one coming up too next year, don't you? We're scheduled uh, tentatively for uh, December of, of next year, George. Uh, the flight is uh, STS-120, uh, ISS Flight 10A will be uh, taking U.S. Node 2 up to the space station. Looks like Steve has just about finished his strap-in. You can see there that he's got one of his checklists, one of his flight data file books out. And I'm sure that's his ascent checklist. He wants to get that out to the proper page and uh, be ready to start procedures uh, once the strap-in is complete here. There's uh, George uh, attaching some of uh, Steve's personal gear, his uh, clocks and uh, other checklists that he'll need to keep track of events as they unfold during the launch process. I gather at this point when they need to communicate, they can either talk with the firing room or they can talk with uh, the flight director back in Houston. They can. Uh, almost all of the uh, communications uh, prior to launch is done through the NASA test director here in the orbiter test conductor here in the firing room. A few, uh, a few bits of information will get passed from Houston, uh, namely weather data and uh, some information about the launch. Here you see George uh, shaking hands with the crew for the final time. So he's completed his job on the flight deck and uh, he will go down and uh, help get the non-flight items out of the mid-deck. All smiles for George on a, on a job well done, I'm sure. And we see uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lee Archambault entering the flight deck now to work his communications uh, equipment checks with the, the two mission specialists on the flight deck.
we were talking about a communications. Uh, the crew also obviously can communicate with themselves. Uh, we can't hear that communications, but uh, you can see that uh, each one of the crew members can uh, communicate on the intercom system. And there you, we see uh, Lee Archambault uh, just double checking all of uh, Suichi's gear and making sure that he is strapped in properly and that uh, the harness, the parachute, the communications, the oxygen, the cooling are all hooked up properly and working properly. And in just a few moments, we'll hear Suichi's uh, communications checks begin. OTC MS1 com check. S1, this is OTC. I have you loud and clear. Good morning, Soichi. Loud and clear. Good morning, Mark. This is NTD. I have you loud and clear. Good morning, Soichi. Loud and clear. Good morning, Jeff. Houston, MS-1, come check. MS-1, Houston, we have you loud and clear. Good morning, Soichi. Loud and clear. Good morning, Huck. And it sounds like Suichi's comm checks went smoothly. You can see there, George, that he does have his visor down at this point. And he'll raise it up here when he's complete with his comm checks. As you can imagine, with that uh, comm cap assembly and the helmet and the pressure suit on, it's very difficult to hear anything other than what comes through the communication systems. So we do want to make sure that those are working just right, and we pay a lot of attention to those to make sure that each crew member can uh, receive and transmit properly. After the uh, crew module is closed, do they tend to chat among themselves, or uh, is it fairly quiet, or yeah, what's the atmosphere like? I'm sure that it's uh, very focused. Uh, with with uh, brief moments of levity, you'll uh, you can imagine that uh, with a few hours to to sit around, that uh, that the crew would uh, chat amongst themselves on the intercom system. But I think most of the communications going on is going to be quite serious and quite professional. That the crew is very focused at the task at hand. And that uh, they they got a upcoming uh, eight and a half minute ride to orbit, and that uh, they need to be uh, extremely focused on that task. We have you loud and clear. Good morning, Stevie Ray. It's good to hear you all on board. Hey, good morning, 
good morning, Hawk and the whole team. Good to be here. You're loud and clear. And uh, there we hear Steve Robinson's uh, checks with uh, everyone to make sure that his gear is working properly. In just a moment here, um, we'll see Lee finish up his uh, his checks on the flight deck and uh, start removing all the non-flight items and closing out the uh, flight deck for launch. Lee is a uh, very experienced uh, Air Force pilot, test pilot. Flew the uh, F-117 uh, stealth fighter during Desert Storm. He's a classmate of mine, and he's a wonderful gentleman. And he, he's assigned uh, his first space flight. He'll be the pilot of uh, STS-117 next year as well. We want to make sure that we've got an astronaut on the closeout crew to uh, to help the uh, the crew with uh, all of their gear and their switch throws and to make sure that uh, all the systems check properly. Because of the uh, limitations of uh, laying on your back and uh, in a launch and entry suit, uh, as you can imagine, it, it is difficult to uh, do all those pre-flight checks that you would normally do in an airplane by yourself. So we have another astronaut on board to help them do all of that. A tradition that was started uh, back in the Mercury and Gemini days with the original astronauts. Looks like he may be backing out. PDR, TC. And there you hear some communications with the orbiter test conductor and uh, Lee Archambault and the crew module about uh, doing the final communications checks with the crew and uh, with the entire crew and then setting up the uh, ascent camera, which he'll install at this time. That is uh, NASA test director Jeff Spaulding in the center of our screen.
And George, we got uh, good communications checks between uh, all crew members. You heard it there with the uh, firing room here. And they'll repeat those uh, with Houston here in just a few moments. Okay, we see uh, Lee has finished the installation of the uh, mini camera that's installed uh, uh, in front of the aft window there, and that's got a small camera on board, and that that video is uh, recorded uh, on board. And what, what will that camera do that they've installed? That camera is um, looking forward in the flight deck and at uh, a wide angle lens at uh, the field of view and encompasses all four crew members uh, and looking out the orbiter forward windows. And it's recorded on a uh, digital video recorder on board. And we can downlink that at a later time and uh, use it for post flight, uh, post flight appearances purposes. But it's also um, useful to uh, to analyze what actually happens inside the crew module on ascent. And Houston, Discovery, CDR and PLT are configured. Okay, Discovery Houston for CDR and PLT, com check on air to ground one only. CDR loud and clear. PLT loud and clear. We have you both loud and clear. Configure for air to ground two. And Discovery Houston, once again for CDR and PLT, com check on air to ground two only. CDR, loud and clear. PLT, loud and clear. And you are both loud and clear, configure for air to air. And here we hear, uh, we're in the midst of uh, communications checks between the crew and uh, Houston on the different uh, radio frequencies that we use, George. And Discovery Houston, once again for Eileen in Vegas, com check on air to air only. CDR, loud and clear. PLT, loud and clear. And we also have both of you loud and clear. You can configure for SIMO voice checks. George, there's, a, there's some wonderful views of the orbiter on Houston Pad 39B. For the entire crew. And Discovery Houston, we have you all loud and clear. This completes the air-to-ground voice checks. Thanks. module being closed up for flight. I, this is just a beautiful view of uh, the whole space shuttle vehicle and with the gaseous oxygen vent arm on top of the external tank. And the orbiter access arm uh, there on the left side of the orbiter with the white room on the end of it. 
it's just a beautiful view there. Uh, and you can see the white room there uh, just to the left of the uh, space shuttle orbiter. That arm will get uh, moved away from the vehicle uh, just prior to launch, but uh, we'll be able to move it back and uh, very quickly. And if we needed to evacuate the pad in a hurry, we had to get the crew out. We can uh, get that orbiter access arm back over to uh, to the hatch in a hurry and get the crew out if we needed to. It was uh, magnificent last night. Uh, I left the pad at about uh, 8.30 or 9 o'clock yesterday evening and the xenon lights were on and the sun was setting in the west and uh, the rotating service structure had been backed away from the vehicle and uh, it was just a majestic sight, just part of, uh, just part of the tanking, and uh, we were just about the last folks to leave the pad last night, and it was uh, a wonderful sight. And we just heard uh, NASA Launch Director Mike Leinbach confirm to Jeff Balding, NASA Test Director, that things continue to look um, look good, and that we have a good shot of this today. That's great, George. We need to make sure that, uh, of course. Uh, Everything goes continues to go smoothly, and uh, got uh, like And George, uh, we just heard the uh, Houston flight director, Leroy Kane, uh, come on the uh, communications loops to give a final launch time update. And uh, we've decided today on uh, 10.39 and zero seconds as our preferred launch time. We've actually got about, it looks like about a nine minute, nine and a half minute window uh, this morning. And we prefer to launch right in the middle of that window. And that's the time that uh, they've selected today. And here we have uh, the closeout crew members uh, ready to uh, remove that uh, yellow umbilical, which is uh, chilled air that's uh, flowing into the crew module to keep the, um, the crew module at a, a comfortable temperature. Uh, as you can imagine, all of the equipment on board uh, does generate quite a bit of heat. And we want to make sure that uh, the equipment and the crew are both at a comfortable temperature prior to the hatch closure. So that uh, that yellow hose is uh, is what that's for, is to provide a, a steady stream of uh, chilled air into the crew module. And you see the Travis Thompson and Tim Seymour there doing final inspections of the hatch. It looks like Tim's got a, uh, a wipe that he wants to make sure that the seal is perfectly clean. He's got that flashlight there. And 
they'll uh, they'll clean that seal uh, absolutely clean, and then you'll in a few moments uh, we'll see them move the hatch to the closed position and uh, start their uh, their final checks and make sure that the uh, the seal is absolutely tight. That there aren't any leaks. Several of the um, cables that uh, were installed in the crew module are now being pulled out. You can see Mr. Seymour doing that. I believe those cables is, uh, were carrying the uh, video signal that we were seeing just a few moments ago on the, uh, the strap-in cameras on the flight deck and mid-deck. Those, uh, those camera views that we were watching uh, are from temporary cameras that are installed uh, prior to the crew showing up and they are removed just prior to, to flight. So once those cameras come out, we're into, into closeout, crew module closeout. It looks like they're pulling out gear right now. We've got cables. I just saw a platform uh, removed before a flight platform come out. And we've just got a few more items to remove and uh, we'll be ready to close the hatch and we should hear the orbiter test conductor and the NASA test director give a go for that in just a few moments. CCSC, OTC. CCSC. Yeah, need you on 232 for S band to high power. RCRT with you, please. Copy that. We are ready, NTD. Okay, that's 714. And Mila, NTD 713, complete. NTD, Mila. 714, you also. George on 106, audio. George, it looks like we're uh, doing some final seal cleaning here on the hatch. And those are our two hatch technicians standing right there, uh, Tim and Renee. And in the countdown, we just got the uh, word that uh, the NASA tech director is telling the Mila tracking station here at the Kennedy Space Center to uh, go on to uh, configure for high power. Oh, that's great. That uh, means we're getting close to the uh, S-band communication systems as two power settings and we've gone to high power that will allow the uh, communications uh, through uh, Merritt Island tracking station to, uh, to s communicate with the vehicle uh, all the way uphill. Here comes some more uh, platforms out of the crew module, George, and we've just about got them all now, I think. We should hear a call in a few moments from uh, Lee Archambault in the crew module that all nine flight items have been removed and that they're ready for hatch closure. OTC, ask OTC. Okay, sir, I'm ready to tell you that all nine flight items are removed from the crew module at this time. I'm ready to terminate comm between uh, myself and, uh, and LCC. Uh, the uh, strapping camera is verified, uh, removed, and uh, we've made a once-over, and we're happy with the vehicle. And the ascent camera is powered up. 
That's affirmative, and we, we verified the uh, good video. Copy that, thank you. That completes uh, 611, 612, 613, and 614. Ask, thank you very much for your support. Good day. Okay, it's been a pleasure, and we'll see you outside. Looking forward to a good launch. That sounds like a job well done by the closeout crew and uh, astronaut Lee Archibald in the crew module and making sure that uh, all of his tasks are performed in a timely fashion and that uh, he's confident that uh, the crew module is ready for flight. I'm sure that Eileen Collins and uh, Jim Kelly and the rest of the crew are also double checking all their switch positions and, and that uh, if they had found anything wrong they would have told Lee about it and we would have heard about it. And uh, Sounds like uh, they are just uh, ready to go. Got about uh, well, just a little less than uh, two hours to go here and uh, we should see the hatch being closed here momentarily. Looks like the closeout uh, personnel in the white room are uh, busy and readying themselves to do final checks here. Still have not seen uh, Lee emerge from the crew module. I imagine he's just uh, double checking the mid deck to make sure that everything's completed. CGLS on 212. GLS, we're getting ready to do the leeward vent doors. I want to give you a heads up for 686. 686, GLS copy. PVD OTC, 687. Uh, OTC is PVD 686, 687, 688, 689 are not performed. and we will uh, apply a positive pressure to the crew module and uh, ensure that the hatch is, is not leaking. It's a very small positive pressure. We want to ensure that that hatch absolutely does not leak uh, prior to launch. It's uh, a redundant hatch. It has a, an inner seal and an, an outer seal and an intermediate area that is also pressurized. A very complicated device, but as you can imagine, uh, we want to ensure that uh, that there is absolutely nothing coming out of that hatch uh, until they get back on the runway back here at the Kennedy Space Center in, uh, in, uh, at the end of the mission.
We can, yeah, we can see the uh, astronaut support person's uh, bag there, his uh, gear, his tools, his uh, checklist, and, uh, and equipment that he needed to do his job is uh, right there. Uh, Dennis Sparks there uh, remo removing that. And uh, here comes Lee out of the crew module. So uh, they have double and triple checked that everything's out. And uh, now Lee is completing the crew module, and he's uh, a hearty well done from his uh, closeout crew member mates there. Now his job, uh, one of the most critical jobs for the astronaut on, on the closeout crew here is to hold this hose <laughs> for the uh, hatch technicians as they get ready to close the hatch. That area around the uh, crew module and in between the uh, the payload bay and the white room is uh, purged with uh, gaseous nitrogen. And we want to ensure that there's a uh, good stream of fresh air flowing into that area for fear that a, uh, a nitrogen pocket might uh, incapacitate one of the uh, closeout crew members in the event of a leak. So that's one of the reasons that we've got that hose out there at this point. Here you hear, uh, see uh, Tim and Renee moving uh, the platforms and the uh, and the guards that uh, the covers that surround the hatch area. We uh, place those platforms in place to ensure that uh, no damage is done to that area as people and person uh, personnel and equipment are moving in and out of the crew module over the uh, processing time and up until launch. And we'll move those out of the way and then. Uh, Remove the final seal protectors here, no, sir. and then they'll close the hatch. This time, and I can give you a zero zero three nine for step six eleven. Got it. And I'll put my NASA on with you. Hang on. OTC, CCMA, back from 128. I believe uh, we just heard the orbiter test conductor give the uh, OVCC closeout crew leader a, a go for hatch closure. Yes, sir, uh, 27.200, sequence 16, 611. And verify all items removed from the crew module. What's your number? My number is 87 Tango. Happy you, already, that. you already have the uh, Travis's? At Travis. Copy that. Okay, thank you. CMPC 611 complete. I copy. And OVCC OTC. He's just getting ready to come back on that at this moment. Okay. OTC, OVCC. Okay, Travis, moment of truth. You have a go to close and latch the hatch for flight for Operation 267. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And work. Copy. 690, same Houston. Copy. Uh, George, I spoke prematurely. We just got the, uh, the final go uh, at that point uh, from uh, the orbit test conductor to Travis to, uh, to close the hatch for flight. After the hatch is closed, they'll do these final leak checks, and then uh, they'll begin to secure the white room. They'll uh, fold up the portion of the white room that is uh, directly adjacent to the orbiter. But the uh, arm and the uh, white room deck will remain in place until just prior to launch. The uh, closeout crew will then evacuate the pad, and they'll leave the pad surface and uh, get in their vehicle and uh, position themselves uh, here on the center. Uh, in a position where they would be, have rapid access back to the pad if they needed to get back there in a hurry for anything. They'll remain on station there until, uh, until launch. Eileen and her crew uh, on board now and uh, sitting comfortably in their seats and waiting for hatch closure. They really don't have uh, any procedures to do at this point. Um, once we do get the hatch closed, then uh, they'll have a, a few things to do. Uh,
And then coming out of the uh, T-minus nine hold, uh, it'll get quite busy for them. And we see the hatch being closed right now. George, it's swung around and put in place. They'll engage the, uh, the locks and then they'll remove these uh, small thin slips of paper that you can see surrounding the hatch. And those, uh, those are very slippery, Teflon coated. paper and they allow the uh, seal to engage properly and they're slipped out uh, after the hatch is closed. OTC, CGLS on 212. GLS, go. Can we get a go for step uh, 776, uh, GLS mainline activation? You got to go on mainline activation. Okay, thank you. Preparing now in the uh, countdown to activate the ground launch sequencer, which is the computer here in the firing room that will control all of the countdown activities for the last uh, nine minutes up until it hands off to Discovery's onboard computer at T-minus 31 seconds. It'll be checking over a thousand parameters during that last nine minutes. And those are a thousand very critical parameters. And um, it... Uh, Everything has to go uh, just on time and just in order. And uh, the redundancy that we've got built in, I'm sure, will allow that to happen. It looks like uh, Renee is, uh, ins and Tim are inspecting the hatch there, and uh, they've got the lock engaged. We have a, uh, a NASA quality control uh, expert on the closeout crew team to uh, ensure that everything is done uh, according to uh, specification and that he's the final inspection. And we see Rene uh, with a uh, digital multimeter there. He's got to check that we've got uh, good continuity between the hatch and the and the rest of the vehicle. And OTC, CGLS on 212. GLS, go. I give you step 782, GLS mainline activation is complete. And that's step 776 through 782 are complete with a not perform on 779. And the closeout crew at this point's probably got another 15, uh, 20 minutes of work to do here Stop. in the white room before uh, leaving the pad itself. Well, and the, uh, the hatch is closed, and it looks like the final uh, closeouts in the white room there are going well. So um, we thank you very much for coming and talking with us today and uh, providing some insight into all the things that uh, go on in closing out the crew module and uh, what the astronauts and uh, the closeout crew is doing. George, it's my pleasure, and it's an uh, uh, absolute uh, joy to be here. And, uh, Especially on uh, such a beautiful day, and uh, working with uh, working with the thousands of people uh, here at the Kennedy Space Center and uh, the Johnson Space Center that take part in this great process in human spaceflight, and uh, it's just uh, I'm just real honored to be here and uh, and talking to you and and uh, helping folks understand what all the hard work and 
has gone in and all the hard work that's gone into this and what all the hard working people have done to uh, make this happen and uh, I'm confident that things will continue to go well and it looks like the weather's good and uh, we should see a good launch here in just a little bit thanks for inviting me up and uh, i'll talk to you next time alan thanks so much DPS? Yes, go. DPS launch countdown sequence activation complete, step 803. This is Shuttle Launch Control, T-minus 34 minutes, 47 seconds and counting. Shuttle Weather Officer Kathy Winters has just briefed Mike uh, Leinbach, the NASA Launch Director, and the uh, chance of having a uh, an overall launch weather criteria violation is 10%. That's uh, based on uh, uh, largely on return to launch site uh, possibility of showers. And uh, 
actually 0% as far as the launch uh, weather conditions out at the launch pad are concerned. At uh, launch time, uh, temperatures uh, will be in the mid-80s, scattered uh, clouds 12 to 15,000 feet. few uh, clouds to the southwest. And we're going to have at least one Tau site, possibly two, uh, Maroon and Zargosa. Both uh, may come into line. So at the moment, we're quite optimistic uh, for launch site weather, Tau weather, and R RTLS weather. At T minus 33 minutes, 25 seconds, and counting, this is shuttle launch control. Perform Ohm's DN2 pressurization, step 834. Ohm's DN2 pressurization in work. LT OTC.
WCDR, pass DFS transfer prep is complete. DC copies, thank you. GPS OTC. GPS OTC at around one. GPS here. Step 828. DPS, I can verify step 20, 47, we're looking for that. It's your mech pre-flight, you got to go on that. Copy. Discovery Houston for the entire crew, comp check. Houston, CDI, loud and clear. DLT. MS-1, MS-2, MS-3, MS-4, MS-5. And Discovery, once again, we have you all loud and clear. We can start you on your FDF updates. We'll begin in the ascent checklist page. 1-10. Let me know when you're ready. And Houston, Discovery is ready on page 1-10. Okay, Eileen, your uh, altimeter setting remains the same at 30.03. I'll copy. Okay, moving on to the flip book. We'll start on page 2-4. Let me know when you're there. Thank you, Stan. Discovery's ready to copy. Okay, this uh, is with regards to the no comm mode boundaries section. We'll start you in that section on the top right corner for two engine Zaragoza 104. Your new number is 6.1. And then back to the left hand column, new press to ATO 11.1, single engine ops 3, 12.3, press to Miko 14.3 and single engine press 17.9. How copy? OTC, CL212. CL go. Yeah, I need to get cab pressure reading on panel 01. It's CDR, OTC. Uh, CDR, step, I will check. And CDR pressure reading on panel 01 is 1515.0. You shall copy, thank you. Ready with the read back. We're ready. Two engine Zaragoza 6.1, plus to ATO 11.1, single engine ops 3, 12.3, plus to Miko 14.3, single engine plus 17.9. That's a good read back on all, Eileen. On the facing page, ascent procedures for the throttle bucket, you are check PC to 72 is 
decimal 81 Mach, and check TC back to 104 will be 1 decimal 27. I'll copy. Good copy, and you can flip the page over to 2-6. Down on the bottom, under planar window, you can NA the second column. We'll just be using uh, the first column today for planar window number one. And your nominal ohms to HT is 91.2, and your NOCOM ohms to HP is 8.5. I'll copy. Copy as well on the facing page all the way at the bottom under post nominal ohms assist. There's no change to your percent ohms per side. That is remains 7.4. However, small change to dump time. It is now 2 colon 1 7. I'll copy. That's a good copy. Uh, your next update is back in the ascent checklist, page 8-6. Let me know when you're there. And then, uh, yeah, you probably realize that's actually page 8-7. Uh, bottom left-hand corner, your max rates in first stage. Uh, roll 2 degrees per second at 70 seconds. Pitch 1 degree per second at 70 seconds. Yaw less than 1 degree per second. And trajectory lofting in second stage is none. How copy. This is shuttle launch control at T minus 20 minutes and counting. Go into the 20 minute built in hold in 2, 1. T minus 20 minutes and holding for 10 minutes. The countdown will resume once again at 9.34 a.m. During this period, the NASA test director will ask members of the launch team to verify that the proper software has been loaded aboard for the remainder of the countdown. Also during this hold, we'll get a verification that the pre-flight inertial measurement unit alignment has been completed. At T minus 20 minutes and holding, this is shuttle launch control. Right now, and we anticipate being able to uh, give you Zaragoza here, but we can't make that call just yet. Uh, you can expect us to call you back in a little bit and uh, make that official. Okay, we'll stand by on the towel. And that completes your ascent checklist updates. Thanks. Thank you, Houston Discovery. Copies, break, OTC, CDR. CDR, OTC. So we did reset the master alarm during the call up from Houston for the cabin test. See that in ECL, you copy? Kennedy. Sorry, copy. PDO reset a master alarm during the Oh, yeah, the yes, I did. Okay. 
All personnel air to ground one, verify your software, step 890. RPS OTC on 212. Just your RPS. 888. 888 is complete. CCSE, OTC, head around one. CCSE. Yeah, look at uh, 933. Is that not performed? CSP power down will be not performed. Cap. NTD on 212 for comp check. Oh, I'm clear, Amy. Have you the same, thank you. Roger. CHGD, CGSS, and JBFX, verify active on channel 212 and monitor only on 232 for remainder of count. CHGD? HGD verify. CGSS. CSS verify. And JBFX. JBFX verify. Thank you. Launch team members moving over to the flight channel now along with the astronauts so that uh, everyone is on the same page, so to speak. Everybody will be monitoring and uh, talking on the same channel from uh, now to uh, the launch. We have about five minutes remaining in this yes, plane, 10 minute built in hold. Our GLS milestones are as listed, 
And that concludes the T-minus 20-minute briefing. Attention all personnel, our countdown clock will resume in three minutes. Entity N212. Go ahead. Okay. Um, we got a div in here, you know, for our 15-minute uh, snapshot for data. Can we do that now before we start counting, or do we need to do it after we go through, uh, start going through transition? It's after op transition complete. Okay. Stuck kind of right in the middle there of a few call-outs, and just we'll, do, we'll, we'll manage it up here. Shuttle launch control, T minus 20 minutes and holding. We have about 45 seconds remaining in this planned built in hold. When we come out of the hold, we'll be transitioning to Ops 101, which means the primary ascent software will be loaded aboard and the computers on Discovery configured for launch for the Ops 101 program. Coming out of hold now in 10 seconds. In 5, 4, 3, Countdown 2, clock 1, on my mark. T minus 20 three, minutes and counting. Two, one, mark. T minus 20 minutes and counting. OTC, CL212. CL, go. Okay, we just want to let the crew know we're getting ready to remove the probe and they'll probably get a master alarm. Classroom. CDR, OTC, copy. The solid rocket booster retrieval ships, Liberty and Freedom, are standing by now in the Atlantic Ocean. The ships departed from Hangar F at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station on Monday at 10 a.m. Their location is now 140 nautical miles northeast of the Cape Canaveral Lighthouse off the coast of Jacksonville. The ships are expected to return to Port Canaveral at approximately 7 p.m. on Wednesday, at which time the boosters will be removed from the water and washed down and then on Thursday morning, the booster inspections will begin. Yes, 
Right now, the SRB retrieval ships are performing a radar and visual search of the impact area to ensure that it is clear of ships and are relaying the sea conditions and weather reports back to the shuttle weather officer. Ships can cruise at a speed of up to 27 knots, depending on the weather, and can carry enough fuel for a range of 7,000 miles and enough food and water for up to 30 days. The ships have berth for up to 24 crew. At about an hour before launch, very shortly, the ships would be moving to their terminal support point, a position which is 8 to 10 nautical miles from the predicted point of impact. After the boosters are jettisoned two minutes into flight at an altitude of 30 miles, they will continue upward for about another 70 seconds to about 42 miles before they begin freefall toward the Atlantic Ocean at a speed of 230 miles per hour. At about three miles in altitude, a drogue chute will deploy to begin slowing the fall to the water, and at about one mile above the water, the main chutes deploy, creating a more gradual fall. The total descent to the water takes about seven minutes, and the boosters will impact the ocean at a speed of about 51 miles per hour, usually about seven miles apart. The booster recovery operation then begins. It takes about six hours. The boosters will be plugged, and compressed air will be pumped into the interior, which is a procedure known as dewatering. This will change their configuration in the ocean from vertical and bobbing up and down like buoys to horizontal, resembling logs in the water. This is called the log mode. This is a way they can be towed back easily by the booster retrieval ships to Port Canaveral. After the ships arrive back at uh, port on uh, early Wednesday evening, they will tow the, tow the boosters through the locks to the Banana River and then turn north for about four miles back to the Hangar AF booster disassembly facility where the boats are stationed. At that time, then, they will be removed from the water, washed down, and the inspections will begin. At T minus 16 minutes, 10 seconds and counting, this is shuttle launch control. ELT, Set. Configure your horizontal situation displays for your checklist. DSS to Ops 1 is complete per the checklist. Copy that, and you have a go for your uh, contingency award. You'll have steer for your.
at uh, Zaragoza for now. Copy, and you got to go on helium where you can save. Shuttle launch control, T minus 11 minutes, 40 seconds and counting. Weather at Zaragoza is acceptable for a landing overseas, should that be necessary, and the crew has selected Zaragoza as the primary TAL landing site. away from going into the hold at T minus nine. personnel countdown clock will hold at nine minutes in one minute. Standing by to go into the hold in five seconds. Three, two, one. T minus nine minutes and holding for 45 minutes. We will now go to the Johnson Space Center in Houston to Mission Control, where we will check on the readiness of Houston flight to support today's launch. Going now to Mission Control in Houston. This is Mission Control Houston here in the shuttle flight control room. The ascent entry team of flight controllers has been on duty since the early hours this morning, assisting uh, with the final hours of the countdown as needed, overseeing activities here in Mission Control. For Disco Discovery's climb to orbit will be ascent entry flight director Leroy Kane, providing communications with Discovery will be spacecraft communicator Capcom Ken Ham. The team here has been working no concerns with any systems on the spacecraft uh, as the countdown has progressed, all in good shape and ready for launch at this point. 10, Currently, uh, 
focus is uh, monitoring the weather, both at the Kennedy Space Center's shuttle runway and also at transatlantic landing sites abroad, uh, two sites in Spain at Zaragoza and Marone, and one site in France at Istres Le Tube, a commercial airfield. The weather forecast at uh, those sites is of interest in the event that they are required for a landing by discovery during a engine problem or other problem that would necessitate an abort of its climb to orbit uh, during the latter stages of, the, of its ascent. During the early stages of its ascent, it would perform a landing back at the shuttle runway at the Kennedy Space Center in an abort called a return to launch site abort. The weather forecast at Kennedy uh, poses no concerns for that uh, possible abort. Weather must be acceptable for that for a launch. Overseas, uh, weather at all three TAL sites has been uh, go at times during the morning. The preferred TAL site is Zaragoza, a Spanish Air Force base at Zaragoza in Spain. The weather there has been uh, forecast no-go some of the time due to a chance of showers in the vicinity. Uh, however, currently it appears that those showers are diminishing and uh, may be removed from the forecast. If so, it will become the primary transatlantic landing site for Discovery's ascent to orbit. Only one of the TAL sites must be forecast go for launch to proceed. Uh, at Maroon, Spain, uh, weather is forecast go as well. And at Istres Le Tube, uh, the forecast has been go also. One uh, maneuver that Discovery will perform uh, after its main engines have cut off at eight and a half minutes after launch, uh, shortly afterward as it jettisons the external fuel tank will be an external tank photo maneuver to allow the crew to take digital still photos and video of the external tank at a much closer distance than previously done on past shuttle flights, uh, cutting that distance uh, in less than half, actually a distance of about 1,300 feet or so anticipated for those photos. Uh, that'll occur about 11 and a half minutes after launch, about uh, three minutes after cutoff of the main engines for discovery. Okay. Are you ready for the final window determination discussion? Flight is ready. Okay. Uh, channel 231. Going to 231. As uh, discovery continues uh, through the final minutes of the countdown aboard the International Space Station, uh, that uh, crew of NASA Science Officer John Phillips and Commander Sergei Krikalov has spent the day preparing the station, some final preparations for the arrival of discovery in a couple of days. Phillips also taking advantage of time to conduct uh, continuing experiments in physiology. The station crew will attempt to see the launch uplinked to them by mission control live as it happens this morning. At the time of launch, the station will be over the Indian Ocean to the south of Australia. Again, all activities are progressing well on mission control at T minus nine minutes and counting. This is mission control, Houston. now for verification of all of our uh, ground assets? Yes, I'm ready to give you that. Okay. You ready for the fill-in? Sure. Okay, long range north, seven. Long range south, eight. Medium range north, six. Medium range south, five. Medium range west, six. Short range, three. All assets are up in green. Okay. All others on the deviation, and I think we just mark as uh, supporting for all the other locations, correct? That is correct, and I've got that filled in in my copy of the book. Very good. This is shuttle launch Thank control, you. T minus nine minutes in holding, 40 minutes remaining in this hold. Confirmation that the weather is good for RTLS, or on Tom to return to launch site standpoint. Conferred on we time today. Please, if you'll set up for that. Copy, will do. Mike Leinbach uh, directing the NASA and test director entity. to set up for the yes. nominal launch time, 1039, straight up. For ground camera status. All ground assets are up and supporting. And we do uh, did record all the number of views for each of the uh, categories on the DEV here. I can share the, those numbers with you all. And we have uh, exceeded all of the minimum numbers for all of the views available for the long, medium, and short-range trackers. Okay, so no shortfalls reported. No shortfalls. And does that include the two airborne assets? Up front. Very good, thank you. 
confirmation that uh, all of our optic sites yeah, are go, including the WB-57 aircraft. We're going to look now at uh, some videotape of those WB-57 aircraft being prepared for launch. Copy on the first time, no updates. The uh, WB 57 is a high altitude jet that will attain experimental imagery if Discovery's launch as it flies at an altitude of 60,000 feet. This is the steerable optics platform in the nose of the WB 57. This uh, experiment is called WAVE, which stands for WB 57 Ascent Video Experiment. It's a nested acronym. There are two high-definition color cameras and a near-infrared camera. The two aircraft took off from Patrick Air Force Base approximately two and a half hours before launch and entered a holding pattern, one north of the shuttle's flight path and the other south. If the wave camera system's performance and the image quality is acceptable on this launch and STS-121, NASA will consider use of the system beyond these first two Space Shuttle return to flight missions. These are the crew members on the WB-57 suiting up for their flight. We have approximately 35 minutes remaining in this planned built-in hold. No issues in work by the launch team. Weather at our shuttle landing facility site uh, for return to launch site is go, and weather at uh, Zaragoza for return to launch, or rather overseas emergency landing is go. No launch uh, weather concerns either. Closeout crew, 
five. Did he have any problems getting the cap back installed? No TCO VCC. No, uh, the cap went on. Very, very good. I copy. And with that, NTD, we uh, concur with uh, no constraint to launch. Okay. And do you have a suggestion where to put it? Is it alright if we put it against uh, the run four of our uh, sequence 16 cabin press operations? We have no problem with that constraint. Okay. Copy that. NTD, TBC. Go ahead, TBC. Step 1014 Alpha, can we get that from you? We've seen some of the... Uh Put it as a WB-57 aircraft. We, we've got some other video of the uh, ground-based optical trackers located uh, around the Cape and uh, actually extending all the way up to uh, Ponce de Leon Inlet near New Smyrna Beach and then down to uh, Patrick Air Force Base. Medium-range trackers are located at six night sites near Complex 39 north and south of the pad plus the 11 sites uh, with longer range trackers that also include the uh, ones at Ponce Inlet and down at uh, Patrick Air Force Base. These can uh, take a combination of film and high-speed digital video up to uh, and including 150-inch lenses. In addition, we have two high-powered long-range optical sites. One is located on the Cape Canaveral National Seashore, which we see here, and the other one is in Cocoa Beach. They have 200-inch and 400-inch lenses for film and high-definition video. The operator's joystick is so sensitive it even responds to the heartbeat of the person operating it. This uh, video will be second uh, only to the optics of the WB-57 at altitude as Discovery climbs through the atmosphere. There's also various selections along here for the video output. This particular has additional information onto the outgoing video. And that is the operator's control panel where he controls the uh, the optical tracker that uh, on the day this was taken was a view of the moon. We're proceeding smoothly through this plan built in hold. We have 29 and a half minutes remaining. Countdown continues to go smoothly and routinely. No weather issues.
So one two two one two. Security console entity two one two. Security, sir. Okay, step eight fifty five. You can put that in work if you have not already. Copy that, sir. We'll put that in work. Thank you, and we'll be looking for a call on eight fifty six. Copy that, sir. We'll come back. In addition to the WB fifty seven high altitude aircraft, the high powered optics on the ground, there is also radar. There is a new system, a new wideband and a Doppler radar tracking system that has been installed, which consists of C-band and X-band radars. We're looking now at the construction of the C-band radar site located on North Merritt Island. And together with an X-band, a set of X-band antennas, it will be detecting debris during launch and ascent, should there be any, along with the optics on the ground and the WB-57. This is a 10-meter C-band radar antenna that's being erected here. There will be a larger one erected uh, later downstream the shuttle program. It's currently undergoing build-up at this site, on the, uh, which is located on the Merritt Island Wildlife Refuge, north of Complex 39. This is the X-band radar that works together with the C-band radar. And here is the uh, pedestal for the C-band dish, which will be installed atop this pedestal. This is the instrumentation van that uh, is part of the C-band, X-band complex. And here's the completed uh, C-band radar undergoing testing. Here is the associated X-band radar. And together, they work as a team. This is the uh, X-band radar being put through its paces. And one of these X-band radars was also installed on the Liberty Star, one of the solid rocket booster retrieval ships, which will be able to look back at the shuttle at an angle.
And a third one of these X-band radars was installed at an Air Force installation on Melbourne Beach. So for the launch today, we will have the C-band, X-band combination on Merritt Island, the X-band at Melbourne Beach, and the X-band on the solid rocket booster retrieval ship, all uh, working together to look for ascent debris, along with the long-range optical trackers on the ground and the WB-57 aircraft at altitude. Shuttle Weather Officer Kathy Winters has just reported back to Mike Leinbach once again that as far as launch weather is concerned, we are still go for launch. So much of the STS-114 mission is uh, intended to improve the safety of the space shuttle during launch as well as uh, on orbit and uh, as far as uh, the mission, the astronauts will be demonstrating thermal protection system repair materials and techniques in addition to the objective of providing vital spare parts, water and other supplies to the International Space Station. We'll look now at some video of the work that was done to prepare Space Shuttle Discovery for launch. It's the first power on of Discovery. This is the installation of the orbiter body flap. was followed by installation of the 17-inch quick disconnect, which provides the propellants to the orbiter itself, the main engines. This is the first RCC panel to be installed on the leading edges of the wings, carrier panels. This is uh, looking at some hand sewing of the thermal protection system blankets for the inside of Discovery's nose cap. Do that. Do that. Okay. This is the installation of the rudder speed bake brake actuator onto the orbiter. This is the external airlock being installed. Forward reaction control system is installed on the orbiter's nose.
Next to come was the left orbital maneuvering system pod. This is the wing leading edge sensor installation. And now the installation of space shuttle main engine number two. This is the orbiter boom sensor system in the vehicle assembly building's RMS lab. This is the crew equipment interface test, the uh, window inspection by Jim Kelly and Eileen Collins. Installation of the remote manipulator system. The uh, RMS is on the right in this photograph, and uh, the orbiter boom sensor system was on the left. This is a payload bay door closure. And that brings us to the day of rollout from OPF Bay 3. Discovery now arriving at the Vehicle Assembly Building Transfer Aisle. At this point, it was rotated in preparation for mating to the external tank solid rocket booster stack. This was the uh, second stack of this uh, processing flow. And the mating to the external tank, gradual lowering down to the attach points. And this is rollout to pad 39B. two miles from the vehicle assembly building to pad B. To a point where the road turns to the north. And arrival atop the pad surface. And, and this is a live shot once again at the launch pad where Discovery awaits its launch in only about uh, 23 minutes or so. We have 14 minutes remaining in this planned built-in hold. At T minus nine minutes in holding, this is shuttle launch control.
This is Shuttle Launch Control, T minus nine minutes in holding, 12 minutes and 45 seconds remaining in this plan built in hold. The final ecosystem check that was planned during this hold is complete and the eco sensors are good. Astronaut Kent Rominger continuing to fly the shuttle training aircraft out of the runway to fly approaches and evaluate the weather for return to launch site, which at this time is observed green. Safety. Go ahead, safety. I can go 5989. Copy, thank you. And PAC console NCD, step 989 is verified. Close out cruise back at AB11. PAC copies, thank you. And safety, can you verify 990 then? Uh, I'm still waiting on verification 856, sir. PD security console. Go ahead. The 856. Copy that. Safety 856 to you. With 856, sir, I can verify 990. Copy, thank you. And STM NTD, step 991, we can terminate video track. Put it in work. And MS-1026. This is Shuttle Launch Control, T minus nine minutes and holding. We have eight minutes, 30 seconds remaining in this hold. We should begin to hear some of the final polls going on and the launch director's instruction to the launch team. Very quiet here in fire room three.
Once Discovery has launched, the main engine main engine cutoff will occur at launch plus eight minutes and twenty nine seconds. Taking a look around at the skies around the vehicle assembly building. As the uh, flashing beacon there to the left, the very top of the VAB. And attention all personnel, this is the NTD conducting the launch status check. Verify ready to resume count and go for launch. OTC? OTC is go. TBC? Tank and booster go. PTC? PTC is go. LPS? LPS go. Houston flight? Flight is go. Milo? And Milo is going for launch. STM? STM is go. Safety console? Safety console is go for launch. SPE? SP is go. LRD? LRD is go. SRO? SRO is go. You have range clear launch. Copy. And CDR? Let's go. Copy that. And launch director, launch team is ready to proceed. Copy that, NTD. Thank you very much. Chief Engineer, verify no constraints to launch. My engineering team is ready to go. Thank you, Charlie. KC Safety and Mission Assurance. KSC SMA is go. Thank you, Steve. Payload Launch Manager. Mike, the ISS ground processing team is ready to go. Thank you, Bill. Range weather. Weather has no constraints to launch. Thank you very much, Kathy. Ops Manager. The mission management team is working no problems. We are go for launch. Thank you, sir. Discovery launch director. Discovery here, go ahead. Okay, Elaine, our long wait may be over. Uh, and so on behalf of the many millions of people who believe so deeply in what we do, good luck, Godspeed, and have a little fun up there. And thanks to you, to the launch team, and to everybody in the shuttle program, the crew is go for launch. Copy that, thank you. NTD, you are clear to proceed with this launch. Copy, thank you. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining in the planned built in hole at T minus yeah, nine minutes. Personnel, the countdown clock will resume in three minutes, 30 seconds. ISL. To ISL. Recorder activation is complete. Thank it's you. That's uh, 1047.
Countdown clock will resume in two minutes. The living space aboard Discovery is relatively roomy and comfortable compared to the earlier manned spacecraft. The uh, two floors in the pressurized cabin together provide 2,325 cubic feet of living space. And on launch, the acceleration is relatively mild compared to the earlier flights. The um, Saturn V reached about 7 Gs, whereas the space shuttle launch and landing forces reached a peak of about 3 Gs. Clock will resume in one minute. Standing by to pick up the count in 10 seconds. Five seconds. Four, three, Captain two, Clark, on my mark. one. Three. T minus nine minutes and counting. T minus nine minutes. We are now just nine minutes away from the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery on a mission to the International Space Station. All the down events are being controlled by the launch, ground launch sequence here in the firing room. Here is First Lady Laura Bush, who uh, has come to witness today's launch, along with the invited guests and astronauts' families. So the I my camera is there. <laughs> Coming up now, the final program pre-launch command are going to be put on uh, aboard Discovery. And the uh, pilot is going to activate switches to connect the fuel cell essential buses. Cells connected uh, to the orbiter. Standing by for a retraction of the crew orbiter access arm. TLS is go for orbiter access arm retract. Discovery OTC, it's time for you to return to flight. Our hopes and prayers ride with you. Godspeed, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. That was Orbiter Test Conductor Mark Taffet here in Firing Room 3. The uh, rotating service structure can be moved back into position very quickly if there's an emergency in about 28 seconds. the uh, auxiliary power unit chart recorders that are being started. The TLT OTC perform APU pre-start. Auxiliary power unit pre-start procedure now being performed by pilot Jim Kelly, and he will actually uh, start those at T-minus five minutes in counting.
by flipping switches in the cockpit. Good pre-start on the review. FCC, TLT, AP pre-start complete, three great compliments. Governor Jeb Bush there with the uh, with uh, Laura Bush. Is mom with you? She's right here. Is mom with you? She's right there. She's right here. Staying by for APU start now. Shuttle main engine fuel valve heater is being turned off. Main engine helium purge sequence coming up. Minus four minutes, four minutes and counting. Main engine purge now underway, and the orbiter's aerosurface profile test is beginning. You see Discovery's rudder moving. Main engine gimbal check, steering check coming up. Now we're in start position. TLS is go for ET LO2 pressurization. And now we should have retraction of the gaseous oxygen vent arm, the Gox vent arm. We'll pull away from the top of the external tank, the VA cap, so called. Bipod heaters now being deactivated. One minute, 30 seconds. Sound suppression water system now being armed. T 
T-minus one minute. Solid rocket booster joint heaters now being deactivated. Final check of the solid rocket booster commands. Joint heaters being turned off. Locks and LH2 fill and drain valves closed. Solid rocket booster flight data recorders activated. Standing by for the handoff to Discovery's computers. T minus 31 seconds. The handoff has occurred. Discovery's computers now controlling. Twenty-five. Firing chain is armed. Twenty. Sound suppressor water system is active. Is being activated. Fifteen. Station systems armed. T minus ten seconds. Go for main engine start. Seven, six, five. Three engines up and burning. Three, two, one, and liftoff of space shuttle Discovery, beginning America's new journey to the moon, Mars, and beyond and the vehicle has cleared the tower. Houston is now controlling. Commander Arlen Collins confirming Discovery is rolling off to a course for rendezvous with the International Space Station. feet. This is a view from a camera mounted on Discovery's external fuel tank. Three engines on Discovery are now throttling down to two-thirds throttle to prepare the spacecraft to pass through the area of maximum air pressure and go supersonic. One minute since launch, Discovery speed now 900 miles per hour. Discovery, Houston, go at throttle up. All systems remain go for Discovery. Altitude now nine miles, six miles northeast of the launch pad. One and a half minutes since launch, Discovery's already consumed more than two and a quarter million pounds of propellant. It weighs less than half of what it did at liftoff. Speed now 2,000 miles per hour, altitude 18 miles, 14 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. Standing by now for burnout and jettison of the twin solid rockets. Booster officer confirms clean separation of the solid rocket boosters. Discovery now on its three main engines, second stage. Speed now 3,030 miles per hour, altitude 33 miles, 40 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Discovery's oval maneuvering system engines are now firing to assist its climb to orbit. They'll fire for about 2 minutes and 19 seconds. This again, a view from the camera on the external fuel tank for Discovery. Discovery Houston, two engine Zaragoza. Discovery is two engine Zaragoza. That call that Discovery could perform a transatlantic landing at a Spanish Air Force base in Zaragoza, Spain, if required. Three engines continue to operate well. All systems in good condition. Altitude now 254,000 feet, or about 48 miles. Discovery speed 4,500 miles per hour. 85 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. About five minutes left until cutoff of Discovery's three main engines. Discovery's altitude now 59 miles, 
speed 5,500 miles per hour. Discovery, Houston, negative return. Discovery is negative return. That call confirming Discovery is gaining too much speed and altitude to return to a landing at the Kennedy Space Center if that were required. All systems remain go for Discovery. Just over four minutes to cut off the main engines. During that time, Discovery will more than triple its current speed to reach the 17,400 miles per hour required to achieve Earth orbit. Discovery 200 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center now, altitude 65 miles, speed 6,700 miles per hour. Discovery Houston, press to ATO. Discovery is pressed to ATO. That call indicating Discovery could reach a lower than planned but safe orbit on only two engines if needed. All three engines continue to operate well at full throttle. Speed now 8,000 miles per hour. Altitude 67 miles, 300 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. Discovery Houston, single engine, ops three. Three. Discovery can perform a transatlantic landing on only one engine if required. All continuing to go well. Altitude 67 miles, 350 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. Discovery speed now 9,200 miles per hour. Discovery is rolling to a heads up position now to assist its performance as it uh, finishes its ascent to orbit. Discovery Houston, press to Miko and single engine Zaragoza 104. Press to Miko and single engine Zaragoza 104. Those calls that Discovery could reach its planned orbit on only two engines if needed. All three continue to operate well at full throttle. Just under two minutes to cut off of the main engines now. Discovery Houston, we see a nominal shutdown plan. You will be go for the plus X and go for the pitch maneuver. Good copy. About a minute and a half to cut off of the main engines. Those calls uh, confirming that the crew is go to do a plus X maneuver after jettison of the external tank to clear. Discovery Houston, single engine press 104. Single engine press 104. Plus X maneuver to clear the tank and also then a pitch maneuver that will provide uh, handheld photography by the crew through the windows of the vehicle of the external tank after it's jettisoned. One minute to cut off of the main engines now. Discovery speed, 13,300 miles per hour. Altitude, 65 miles. 615 miles from the Kennedy Space Center. Discovery's three engines are now beginning to throttle back to prevent the spacecraft from experiencing forces in excess of three times that of Earth's gravity as it continues to accelerate. Speed now, 14,800 miles per hour. Altitude, 63 miles. 700 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. 30 seconds to cut off of the main engines. Discovery speed now 16,000 miles per hour. Standing by for cutoff Discovery's three main engines. Officer confirms main engine cutoff for Discovery. Standing by now for jettison of the external fuel tank.
live television as uh, Discovery jettisons external fuel tank. All normal with the cutoff of Discovery's main engines. Discovery performing a maneuver to fire its jets and ensure clean separation from the tank. Discovery, we have a good plus X maneuver. Copy the good plus X. We saw a nominal Miko. Ohms 1 is not required. Nominal Miko, Ohms 1 not required. Commander Eileen Collins will now begin a manual pitch up of Discovery's nose, pitching it up uh, to a point where the overhead windows of Discovery will be faced toward the tank as it uh, begins to fall away, uh, that allowing mission specialist Suichi Noguchi and uh, from the mid-deck, Andy Thomas, to uh, use handheld and video photography to inspect the tank, photography that will be transmitted down to the ground on day three of the mission. Collins uh, will pitch the vehicle up and over to point the windows toward the tank uh, until uh, Noguchi tells her that it's in centered in the windows and ready for photography. <laughs> 